the people as they were then were recorded for posterity. Exactly. Um, so you, you, as you sort of uncovered information which then turned into the two books, uh, and in some cases that was through family members, sometimes it was archives, sometimes it was going to places and talking to people, you turned up the story of the poisoning of the child. Can you tell us about that? Yes, that's terribly sad. Um, the, um, this was Albert's uh, third child and second son. Um, and uh, he was poisoned. The, uh, his mother, who at the age of 26 had just born three children, um, was convinced that it was the ayah who had poisoned her child, um, which was clearly absurd. And anybody would have known that it, 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 the ayah wouldn't have taken chemicals from the studio. Um, but uh, she, the poor girl was tried uh, in Uti and found in the Uti court um, to be guilty of murdering this little boy. Thank goodness uh, the general population in the citizens of Utakamund raised enough money to appeal uh, to Madras for the case to be reconsidered. And it was a, the decision was overturned. And so um, I felt uh, when I was reading the story uh, that, that, that uh, it couldn't have been more frightening, but thank goodness it was so. But I mean, I, 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 what I wondered when I, when I read that was, you make a reference to Zilly, your great-grandmother, yeah. being violent towards her children. I mean, is she the suspect <laughs> in your... I mean, what, what, what do you think happened? <laughs> I, 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 I think Fudd should rewrite the story, don't you? You could make it, you could make it much more exciting. Uh, she was indeed a, a, a fairly... A fairly it never even occurred to me, but... Could be. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, so does that suggest you think maybe the child died from natural causes? Uh, and no, I think, I think the child walking around and uh, got into the studio and took a handful of the chemicals that were lying around and, and did it. But uh, Zilly might have done. I think I'm. <laughs> I, I must take this first. Zilly was the daughter of an Irishman who had fought in the Crimean War. I, I'm of Irish heritage, so my, my hackles are now raising. Uh, uh, he, he was an Irishman, but he became very proper, because, because, uh, because although as an Irishman, he was, his name was spelled E-G-A-N, when he decided to be very proper, he became E-A-G-A-N. And he changed from being a Catholic to being an Anglican. Now that's pushing it. That's pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, are you with me on this? And he got married. Uh, he, he moved, he, after the Crimean War, he stayed over, over here, so to speak, uh, and moved up to Bangalore. He started a boot and shoe factory in Bangalore and he, he did very well. His main market actually was not the general public, it was the army. He provided army boots. Um, but he married a, a pretty woman. Um, uh, she was almost certain, I think, Eurasian, uh, Anglo, Anglo Indian, uh, because her daughter was very pretty indeed. And, <laughs> <laughs> and her daughter, who Albert Penn married, um, Zilly. Uh, she, 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 she was very pretty, but as you say, she did have a, she did have a temper. Uh, and the only, well, one of the, my first contacts of the, of the, in the rediscovered family uh, told me that she was a pretty tough woman. So maybe we can rewrite the story. <laughs> maybe it wasn't just chance, but actually it was mother's fury. <laughs> and, and then you, you also have the... The, the scandalous story, which I, I guess was effectively hidden from you. You don't want me to tell that, too. You know. I, I, I do. The, the scandalous story of your grandfather and the theft of the motor tires. 
I shouldn't have told him. I shouldn't. Should I? <laughs> it's, in, I, it's in the published book. I I I, I, yes. Um, I, I, I think I briefly mentioned early on that my father didn't talk about his family. And the reason for it was that he was ashamed of his own father, my grandfather. My grandfather ran away from Uti, where he was born, to Secunderabad, where he joined up in the army. Uh, and he had a, a, a really brilliant um, young man's career in the army. He rose to be a lance corporal. He was in the 17th, 21st Lancers. And he took part in the last cavalry charge of the British Army at Omdurman. Am I holding this too close? Uh, 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 it, it, the last cavalry charge of the British Army in Omdurman, in which he won the Distinguished Conduct Medal. And I have the, the, the um, references in the newspapers to the boy of valor from Uti. Um, and uh, there was also a, another um, captain uh, who, who who won the VC in that battle. Um, but anyway, he, he then went back. The army in those days used to circulate round um, from, to Ireland and to London and then back out to India. And in three stages, they went round and sometimes down to Cape Town to the complete circuit. Uh, and um, uh, he, my grandfather did well uh, and rose from corporal to sergeant. Um, and he signed on for another 12 years in the beginning of 1909. But then disaster struck because he won the Calcutta Derby sweepstake, which, which, was, which, was, which was millions of pounds, millions. Uh, he immediately resigned uh, from the army. He went back to England, set himself up as, as, a, uh, as a, a gentleman of the country. Uh, he had. So he was totally in, unable to cope with his newfound wealth. Um, and uh, he was playing around with girls, he was drinking too much, and he was also gambling. Because once you've won a few million, you don't mind trying for a few more, do you? Uh, uh, he then um, went out to, uh, joined up in the First World War, and was sent out to the Middle East. Uh, and he, in the Middle East, he contracted malaria and was sent back. And while he was in hospital uh, in England, his wife divorced him. And he didn't defend the suit because clearly he had been playing around. Uh, and then uh, he went back into the army and he came out of hospital. And probably to look after his gambling addiction, I suspect, uh, he, he, was, he, he was selling some of the army goods. And the people in the depot for which he was responsible knew about this and got the police to come up at the right time. And they found him, as you say, selling uh, three outer tires and two inners. Which <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't sound a sort of a very serious misdemeanor, but it, obviously it was because he was by then a senior member of the army. Uh, he was then tried, found guilty, uh, and um, cashiered from the army. Uh, he uh, lost his pension, he lost his money, he lost his future. And he died very sadly in the workhouse. And my father, as a result, never talked about his family at all. And very sadly, I'm almost certain, my father had no idea of the quality of the artistic work that his own grandfather had done. Which is very sad, because my father was a great lover of art. Well, exactly. I mean, it often happens that when, when those sort of events, you know, have an, an, an unhappy ending, that uh, families sort of push them to one side and the history disappears. I mean, what's extraordinary in your case is that, you know, over the last decade or more, you've actually rediscovered so much uh, information. Had, had you ever been to India before you came in search of your great-grandfather? No, I hadn't. I, I'd been uh, to Africa because my father had worked as a district commissioner in the, uh, in the political service in the Sudan, but I hadn't been, hadn't been as far as India. Uh, I knew quite a lot about India, um, simply from relations who had served either in the army or the other sources out here, but I hadn't been here myself. Um, well, now, now you're here. 
welcome to Uti. Um, <laughs> um, can you just tell us a little bit more about the, the sort of introduction of the Kodak and the popularization of photography and how that, what effect that would have had on your, your great grandfather and his studio and the sort of work he did? Yes, it was very, very, it was very sudden. The first Kodak was introduced in 1888. And in no time at all, as I said briefly earlier, people found that they could take their own photographs. And it was no longer a, a bit of mystery. It was just dead easy. You, you snapped. You took your snaps. Uh, but, and uh, I have one advertisement which says, you know, one, two, three, you hold the photograph up, you snap it. And then you send the roll, the finished roll, back to Kodak. They developed it for you and sent you back the print. So that was just too easy. Uh, uh, but it was absolutely disastrous for the photographic, for the commercial photographers. And, uh, uh, and what they did then, um, many of them went out of business, including Penn. In 1899, uh, he sold his business. His studio was just over the road here in Cranley Cottage, I think uh, on Hospital Road, uh, going down uh, towards Tarrant's dental surgery. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Sorry? Oh, really? Well, it, 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 looks, it, it looks exactly like it did before. Now, what's interesting is that uh, when he was in, he had glass plates put in the roofs, glass tiles, and the photograph that I have of uh, Cranley Cottage is with glass tiles on the top, uh, which were used so that he could develop his album and prints without going outside. Even in bad weather, he could still develop. Also, even in bad weather, he could take people in and photograph them. Using the natural light. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, what you described with the, the arrival of Kodak, I mean, the same thing happened just over 100 years later to Kodak itself. Mm. <laughs> when they didn't anticipate that digital photography was going to get serious, and they were effectively, you know, destroyed by technology. It's absolutely, it's extraordinary the way in which it has, uh, history has repeated itself in technology. And probably the, the, the only, only company that, that got ahead of the digital revolution was um, Polaroid, who, who made it into a, you know, a fashionable thing now to have a, have a Polaroid camera. So, you know, teenage... Uh, Teenage children love Polaroid cameras where you can take, take it in an old-fashioned way, pull out the picture, wave it about, and, and, and there it is. Um, let's open up now to, to some questions from the audience. I know there are a lot of people here who will have interesting things to say. Uh, uh, we can do more pictures. We can do more pictures, absolutely. Okay, demand. The studio for 10 years, and these two photographs. Uh, have you got the... Can, can I have the... Can you go back? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have the control? Yeah. Yeah. You want to? Yeah. You want to? Yeah. 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 So th this is the first of um, a, a large picture that, that he did of Uta Kamund. And there are four panels of which this is the first. And you could, if you want to see the real thing, you have to make your way into the Uti Club, where it's uh, just, out, just on the right-hand side of the front door. Um, but in those days, uh, as you know, the Uti Lake was in two parts and with an a, a, a embankment running across the middle called the Bund. So let's go on the next one, please. This is Government Garden, um, which, had, which, was being, which was actually being made at that time by Mr. Uh, William McIver. Uh, and Penn recorded the, 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 really the finished product MacIver was an extraordinary man. He, he achieved all of the, that you can see here uh, uh, and in thing uh, by the use of natural forces. He used the water to move big <coughs> mounts of earth and create the thing, the beautiful picture you can see. And the next picture is the Chinchona. 
Chinchona forest because MacIver was given responsibility for the Chinchonas. And I think the two people down there are MacIver and his nephew. One more. MacIver's on the left hand side uh, with his, his, with his uh, topi off, and his, his nephew uh, is behind. So, he, as you said, um, Francis, he did a lot of uh, pictures of the local people. So, next one, please, is a Toyota hut. Uh, and I, I was fascinated by the fact that the title was simply Toyota hut. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, the title is Entrance to, to the Toyota hut. And I asked uh, Taran, uh, why, you know, why, what was so important about the entrance to Toda Hut? And Taran, you could explain it better yourself, but you said, you explained to me that going under, under the entrance to Toda Hut was actually a form of, of, of obeisance or a form of lowering yourself, and you had to go under the entrance. So even there, you've got this delightful little girl on the left-hand side, and some fine old men making blankets on the right. They are not the subject of this picture. It's the entrance to Toyota Hut with the subject. And the next one, please. So this is just a rather stately group of the Toyota. And the next one. And this is the Toyota Hut, some of which still remains behind the Botanic Gardens. And the next one. And these were the boys in the jungle. Uh, and as I say, I, I have a feeling that, that Albert really had a, a, a soft spot. It wasn't just, he wasn't just making pictures to sell, but he really wanted to show the Toda people as they were. And my evidence for this is that the little book, um, after, uh, after my, my grandfather, Harold, had run away from home, um, Albert sent him a little album of photographs uh, and simply wrote on the inside, Harold with love from home. <laughs> but the po point I wanted to make then was that within that tiny little album, there must have been at least five or six photographs of the Toda. So the Toda were important to the family. Um, on to the next one is the is showing uh, uh, as I said the, f the photographers wanted to show what was happening, how people were behaving, and here is a, a, a quite a, a mature girl, a lady, uh, doing obeisance to the elder by putting her by raising his foot to her forehead. And on to the next one, please. And this is just rather a beautiful picture, isn't it, of lovely girls. I can imagine many uh, passing travellers who have been happy to take that photograph home with them. <laughs> and the next one is the water carrier. So one tends to forget that, of course, they didn't have any pipe water in those days. The houses didn't have any water. But so they had to have a water carrier to take the water round from house to house. And Toda group again. Um, and here um, is the, uh, is the, uh, the, 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 what was called the, the willow mund, which is a Dutch word for an embankment. And this ran across between the two sides of the, um, of the lake. The, 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 the side on the right was the one that was the first to be drained uh, because it had become quite insanitary and was turned into a, a race, or, race course. And all that we have now left is the one side on the left. Next one, please. So these are just some of the views which he was taking, looking right across down through towards Metapaliam, outside Kunor. And the next one. This is one of my favorite pictures. It shows that St. Stephen's Church, but also, of course, it shows the collector's office and it shows the law courts. And the next one. Is Charing Cross as it was when it was first? This is 
almost the first occasion when the, the water was turned on. And there's, uh, there were, he, he had an advertisement in the newspaper saying, come and see the uh, photograph. And you've got Greek school on the right-hand side there. I'm afraid that the, that lovely Adam, Adam's fountain is, is no longer in the rather beautiful condition it was then, even though it's been redone. And the next one is one of my favorites. It, um, it shows the huntsman of, of the Uti hunt. And you can just see under his arm, there's a, 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 a if, if you can, many of you can see it, he's got a, there's a little terrier and there's a little bow. Now, I wonder if any of you know what that terrier was for. It was actually, you know, Gary. Was it, was it for digging out the jackals when they'd gone to ground? Yeah, you've read my book, haven't you? I hadn't read that bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I had, uh, in earlier generations, many family members who were Hunter. interested in, in hunting uh, yeah. foxes and, and, and things like that. I, I always, as, as a child, when I was encouraged to go fox hunting, I always yeah, yeah. went and hid in my bedroom and got an asthma attack or something. Yeah. But it, it, there were others who liked doing such things. Like my older sister, she loved all this stuff. <laughs> uh, and, and the next one is, is, is another rather lovely picture of life as it was then. And this is the roadside view. Next one, please. Uh, which I mentioned earlier. And you can see the three the stages of basket manufacture from the first framework to the finished product on the left. And behind on the right, you can see the rattan mat being manufactured. As I say, they wanted to record life as it was then. And the next one, please, is, uh, is um, uh, Rangosami's peak. And the next one is Twin Falls. It's rather a lovely picture, isn't it? And the next one is Picnic Corner outside Kunor. And the next